My aim in this talk is to outline some of the key ideas of the Danish philosopher and theologian K.E. Lugstrup. I'll first say something briefly about his life and works and then focus on his key text, which is the ethical demand. So Lugstrup was born in Copenhagen in 1905 and died in Aarhus in 1981. He was influenced by the phenomenological movement, Husserl, Scheler, Heidegger, as well as the lesser known German philosopher Hans Lips, and also influenced, of course, by his fellow Dane, Kierkegaard, as well as Lutheran theology more generally. After studying at the University of Copenhagen and spending time on a scholarship travelling in Europe, where he attended lectures by Heidegger and Lips, amongst others, from 1936 to 1943 he was Lutheran pastor in Funen. Then, from 1943 onwards, he was professor in theology at the University of Aarhus, where he remained for the rest of his career. As is clear from these dates, Lukestrup therefore lived through the Nazi occupation of Denmark, an experience which clearly had an impact on his later thinking, as we'll see. Although, as we should also see, there is some similarity between Lugstrup's views and the work of Emmanuel Levinas, there is no evidence they met or, aware of it, or were aware of each other's work. Lugstrup published his main text, The Ethical Demand, in 1956, and there's an English translation by Notre Dame in 1997 and an updated one with Oxford University Press in 2020. In English, extracts from other works can be found collected together in Beyond the Ethical Demand, while extracts from his later book series on metaphysics have also been translated. Oxford University Press also recently launched a translation series of his works, which includes the retranslation of The Ethical Demand, as well as an early work on Kierkegaard and Heidegger, and a later collection of essays called Ethical Concepts and Problems, and these have all been published. And his main critique of Kierkegaard, entitled Controverting Kierkegaard, which will be published with Oxford University Press later this year. So there's been a growing interest in Lugstrup in the English-speaking world, though he is still not widely recognised, though he has always been a significant figure in Denmark. One reason for this neglect is that translations of his work into English have been slow to come, but of course that's also partly a symptom of the neglect. An explanation for this, I think, is that Lugstrup was out of step with the ethics of his own day, but he is arguably closer to ethical thinking now. While there may also be a concern that his position is too theological, which is an issue we will discuss. Nonetheless, Lugstrup is gaining attention outside Denmark, where figures such as Alastair MacIntyre, Sigmund Bauman, Simon Critchley and Stephen Darwell all show appreciation for his work. So I'm now going to turn to The Ethical Demand as Lugstrup's most significant and influential publication and try to bring out its central themes. Lugstrup himself helpfully outlines its main structure as follows in a subsequent reply to his critics. First, I analyse how the life of one person is interwoven with the life of another, and from this I deduce the content of the ethical demand, which has to do with taking care of the life of the other person that has been surrendered to us. Some way into the book, I make it clear that the one-sidedness of the demand presupposes that life has been given to the individual person. I have not thereby moved over to the particularly Christian sphere, however, but continue to clarify what can be stated in strictly human terms. As we shall explore in more detail, the basic structure of the book is therefore as follows. It starts with Jesus and the proclamation, love thy neighbour as thyself. It then asks, how should we understand the proclamation? It then argues that if the proclamation is to be understood properly, it must fundamentally relate to something in our existence. What this fundamental feature must be, Lugstrup argues, is our interdependence. But then to understand that interdependence, we need to look at trust. The logic of trust can then give us insight into the ethical demand 
that is contained in the proclamation, namely the demand to care for others in accordance with their needs. But the nature of the ethical demand only makes sense if we see life as a gift. Lukestrup then considers objections to this account while also considering how the ethical demand relates to social norms, science, poetry and Christianity. Lukestrup argues against a Christian ethics, but he allows that we may need to adopt a Christian account of forgiveness. The book then concludes with the 13th chapter, which offers a polemical epilogue, criticising Kierkegaard. Before looking at this in more detail, it may also be useful to say something briefly about Lukestrup's method in the text, which is a mixture of phenomenology but also metaphysical claims. This itself is a controversial combination as phenomenology is often understood to be independent of metaphysics because it tells us about how things appear rather than how they are. Nonetheless, Lukestrup thinks both are required to do justice to ethics. However, this method, metaphysics is an ethics first approach in the sense that it is ethics that then can ground metaphysical claims rather than vice versa. There is also a focus on language and the insights to be gained by thinking about how we use certain key terms and the differences between them. But while Lugstrup was aware of contemporary analytic philosophy and comments on it, sometimes critically, his main influence here is in fact, again, Hans Lips. And for those who are new to Lugstrup, it is perhaps worth briefly saying that compared to many philosophers, he is a pretty accessible and readable. Turning now to the ethical demand, as I've mentioned, it begins with Jesus' proclamation from the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 22, 36 to 40, where Jesus is asked, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hangs on these two commandments. Lukestrup argues that for this proclamation to make sense to us and so not be coercive, it must relate to something fundamental in our existence, which makes the proclamation necessary. He writes... If the religious proclamation is not understandable in the sense of corresponding to something in our existence, then, accepting, uh, then acceptance of it is tantamount to letting ourselves be imposed upon, either by others or by ourselves. For faith without understanding is not faith, but coercion. Only if one understands a proclamation can one accept it for the sake of its content. So, what in our existence does the proclamation correspond to? The answer, Lugstrup argues, is our vulnerability to one another. As he puts it, if one's relationship to the other human being is the place where one's relationship to God is decided, it must at the same time be the place where the existence of the other human being is so totally at stake that one's failure is irreparable. So it cannot be the case that what I withhold from the other person in one situation, they would be able to recoup either from me or from a third, fourth or fifth person. If we were so independent of one another that the words and works of one person were a mere luxury in the existence of the other, so that one's failure could always be made good later, God's relationship to the individual would consist in a looser relationship to the individual's relationship to the other human being than is the case in Jesus' proclamation. In short, a precondition for the close relation in which Jesus puts the relationship with God and with one's neighbour is, is that we are, as Luther expresses it, daily bread in one another's lives. But precisely this precondition for the close relationship in Jesus' proclamation between the two great commandments can be described in purely human terms. Lukestrup then illustrates that vulnerability with the key example of trust. He argues that successful human relations require us to be able to trust one another. 
where here his experience of the Nazi occupation of Denmark surely influences his thinking through living in a society in which trust had fundamentally broken down. It is integral to human life that we normally meet each other with natural trust. In normal circumstances, we trust the stranger's word and only begin to doubt when we have some special reason to do so. Lukestrup, of course, recognises that we may have to respond to others without trust, as in Nazi-occupied Denmark, but this is a defective form of life, one in which we will struggle to thrive. But, Lukestrup argues, quote, to trust is to deliver oneself up to others, end quote in the sense that to trust is to make oneself dependent on the person one trusts, to make oneself vulnerable to them in a way that cannot be avoided. So trust shows our reliance on one another, which is really a feature of all human relationships. As Lugsrup puts it, an individual never has something to do with another human being without holding something of that person's life in their hands. It can be a very small matter a passing mood, a dampening or quickening of spirit, a disgust one deepens or takes away. But it may also be of tremendous significance, so that it is simply up to the individual whether the other person's life flourishes or not. So I might trust you to return my fr friendly smile in a positive way rather than blank me, or trust you to tell me how to get to the train station, or trust you with my life. Trust runs throughout all human relations at various levels, given our interdependence on each other. But Lugstrup then moves from the account of trust and interdependence that he has given to the ethical implications of it in relation to the demand or call on us that then follows. As he says... As surely as a human being with the trust that they either show or desire places more or less of their life into the other's hands, so surely is the demand to take care of this person's life integral to our existence, such as it happens to be. This means that in any meeting between human beings, there is an unspoken demand, irrespective of the circumstances in which the meeting takes place and the nature of the meeting. But what is this demand? Lugstrup summarises it as follows. The radical demand says that the other's life should be cared for in a way that best serves the other. Lugstrup's thinking here can be set out as follows. The vulnerability of others gives us power over them. The demand says that this power is to be used for their good, not ours, otherwise this would be exploitation. It is thus a demand to use this power to engage in neighbour love or care of the other. Lugstrup then argues that this demand has certain central features, which he summarises using four key terms. Silence, radicality, one-sidedness and unfulfillability, which I will first outline before going into further details. So first of all, the demand is silent in the sense that one cannot just do what the other person asks, nor just follow social norms. It is radical because it demands unselfish love and care. It isolates you as you cannot just follow social norms. It is not based on any right, and it can include the enemy, but it is not limitless. It is one-sided meaning that it offers no legitimate ground for reciprocity or payback for their, that care. And finally, it is unfulfillable as a demand because it demands that love and care should be spontaneous rather than felt as a burden or duty. This, however, means that the demand cannot be met as a demand. For if, if it is experienced as a, as a demand in this way, love and care have already failed as they should be spontaneous. But each of these features seems to cause problems, so let's now look at those problems and how Lugstrup addresses them. So first of all, let's go back to thinking about silence. 
The ethical demand is silent, first of all, in the sense that you cannot just do what the other person asks, but nor can you follow social norms. So, for example, if I find myself responsible for a drug addict, I cannot just respond by giving them the drugs they ask for. Instead, I must do what is genuinely in their interests. But also, Lugstrup thinks, there is a fundamental difference between the ethical demand and social norms, where these norms are required because we cannot be relied upon to care for others, and they thus come with a different set of expectations and motivations. So, for example, there are social norms to drive on one side of the road enforced by various punishments. But although they are designed to protect people, I can count as perfectly well conforming to these norms if I only follow them out of a desire to avoid punishment and with no concern for others. And we need rules like this as we can't rely on people to drive properly otherwise. And they also make driving simpler and more predictable. But still, while following these rules may help others in some sense, following them is not the same as following the ethical demand. But that means in an ethical demand situation, when I must genuinely care for the other, I can't run this just based on the various rules that govern our social relationship, such as laws relating parents and children, or members of professions, or fellow citizens, because these are silent on such matters. And instead, I must here think for myself about what is best for the person concerned. But now, the silence of the demand might seem to lead to three problems that Lugström addresses. First of all, if I don't do what the other wants, won't this involve encroachment on them? Secondly, if I can't follow the ethical demand by following social rules and vice versa, why do we have both and how do they relate? And secondly, if it is silent, isn't the ethical demand empty? So in response to the first problem, Lugstrup argues that although the ethical demand is silent, this does not license a kind of indifference to the perspective of the other and an unwillingness to perhaps change one's own thinking. Rather, a kind of dialogue is needed which allows also for the fallibility of one's own thinking, while at the same time care for the other cannot involve taking over their will. In fact, this underlies Lugstrup's concern with a certain kind of Christian ethics, which he thinks makes both of these mistakes, in dogmatically claiming an authority over conceptions of the good and feeling able to take control over others. In response to the second problem concerning how the ethical demand and the social norms relate, we have already seen that Lugstrup thinks we need the social norms as we cannot rely on people to follow the ethical demand. So these norms are required to protect us from what he calls violence, as he puts it, by giving people different motivations to behave in the right way. And on the other side, Lugstrup argues that while we need social norms, we cannot use them to replace the ethical demand, as in the end social norms cannot entirely specify how we are to live, and so will require the ethical demand. So, for example, while parenthood is protected, oh, sorry, is governed by certain laws and norms in order to protect children, no parent can operate successfully without going beyond them, and understanding the point of such laws and norms is care for their child. In the end, then, these two normative levels turn out to be interestingly interrelated, where Lugstrup uses the metaphor of refraction to explain this. Just as white light is refracted by the prism into a range of colours, so the ethical demand is refracted into a range of social norms by the complexity of our social lives. Finally, in response to the third problem regarding silence, Lugstrup addresses the worry that if the demand is silent, does this make it contentless? Lugstrup argues, however, that unlike more abstract ethical principles, like Kant's principle of universalizability, act on a maxim that can be a universal law, or utilitarianism's principle of utility, maximize happiness, the ethical demand tells you to care for or love 
the other, which while abstract in some sense is concrete in another way, as it then forces you to look at and focus on the other and their needs in detail in a way which these other theories do not. So for example, the Kantian thinks about the maxim of their actions, or the utilitarian thinks about maximising happiness, while the ethical demand requires you to focus on the needs of the person under your power in a way that is arguably more concrete than these other approaches, though it cannot then formulaically tell you how best to serve their good. So to summarise Lugstrup's response on this first issue of silence, first of all regarding encroachment, it's not enough just to do what the other person wants, but this is not the same as seeking to take over their will or to impose one's sense of the good on them as a kind of ideology. Secondly, with respect to social norms, we need social norms as we can't rely on people to follow the ethical demand, so these norms protect us from violence. But norms and demands are not unrelated, as the former should refract the latter. And finally, emptiness. The ethical demand doesn't suffer from Kant's so-called empty formalism, as it tells you to focus on care for the other, which then gives content. But Lugstrup's position is not just particularist, particularistic either, in the sense that this is still a general principle. OK, so turning now to the second feature of the demand, namely its radicality, Lowstrip argues that it is radical because it demands unselfish love and care, it isolates you as you cannot follow social norms, it is not based on any right, and it conclude, can include the enemy, but it is not limitless. We have already discussed the way in which the ethical demand differs from social norms, but can now focus on other features and potential challenges. So first of all, the enemy. Should you love the enemy? Well, in Lugstrup's view, yes, because the enemy too is dependent on you. Secondly, obligations without rights. Lugstrup rejects the view that rights and duties are correlative. Instead, he views rights as based in social agreements, and allows for obligation without rights, which do not rest on such an agreement, such as the responsibility to love the neighbour. For example, the Good Samaritan is required to care for the injured traveller in Jesus' sermon, but not because the traveller has the right to demand such care. Finally, on limitlessness, Lugstrup rejects the idea that we have unlimited responsibility for everything under the sun, as the ethical demand only relates to the power we have as one individual over another. So moral responsibility is not the same as political responsibility. There is thus a difference between the real good Samaritan who is required to help one person in need who is dependent on them, and what Lugstrup calls the political Samaritan, who is operating at the level of social structures. While concern with social structures is also an important part of social life and our obligations as citizens, for example, we might have a responsibility to improve security on the road where the traveller was attacked, for Lugstrup this operates on a different level from the interpersonal vulnerability covered by the ethical demand. Turning now to the third fundamental feature of the ethical demand, it is one-sided in the sense that it offers no legitimate ground for reciprocity or payback for that care. Thus, if the Good Samaritan cares for the injured traveller, the Samaritan then cannot demand something back as recompense. Though if they do need help from the traveller, the latter should of course help them, but as called for by the ethical demand, not as some kind of payback or reward. But then Lugstrup acknowledges he needs some explanation of why, if we care for others, we can't demand something in return. To which his answer is that life is a gift. But then what does that mean? Is it a gift from God or just given in a more secular sense? And what is given? All our abilities as a natural lottery of the sort one finds in John Rawls, 
Or does look strip mean something more specific? This is a controversial issue, but in my view, his claim is that the love we show the neighbor is given to us, and so it is not a matter of virtue or will, which means we can't claim anything back in return for displaying this love to others and thereby helping them. And here, I would argue, we see the influence of Luther on Lugstrup in the claim that neighbor love is a matter of grace, not works, and so not something for which we can demand something in return. We are given that love rather than it being something we instead in ourselves, as the latter would merit the kind of pride that undermines love. Likewise, there is some resemblance here with Levinas. The encounter with the other cuts through our egoism, but not through our own efforts. And if it were the result of our efforts, neighbour love would be undercut by pride. So I would argue that in claiming life is a gift, Lugstrup offers a secular version of the Lutheran account of grace, that our capacity to love and care for others in the way the ethical demand requires is not something to be brought about by our own efforts. And so we can't insist on getting some recompense from others in return, which is what makes the ethical demand one-sided. Lukestrup's position here is arguably made clear in the following passage. To show trust and to deliver ourselves up, to entertain a natural love, is goodness. In this sense, goodness is integral to our human life, though we ourselves are wicked. Both apply completely, so that there is no place for a reckoning in terms of more or less. Often such a reckoning does take place, for example, when it is said that there is at least some good in a human being. To which we can only reply, no, there is not. When speaking of the notion that there is at least some good in human beings, one means to subtract something from wickedness and then add it to goodness on the individual's own account as if trust and love were not given to human beings, but were a human being's own achievements and belonged to the account of the self. But there is nothing to subtract from human wickedness. The self brings everything under the power of its selfishness. The human will is bound in this. The demand to love, that as a demand is addressed to our will, is unfulfillable. Nor can anything be added to the goodness of human life. It is there and is there in completeness, but beforehand, always beforehand, among other things in the realities of trust and love. Finally, we can turn to the fourth and last fundamental feature of the ethical demand, namely its unfulfillability. For Lugstrup argues that the ethical demand is unfulfillable as a demand, not because it asks us to do something exorbitant, but because it demands that love and care should be spontaneous, i.e. the demand should, cannot be met as a demand. For if it is experienced as a demand, love and care have already failed. But then the objection might be raised, how can we be under an unfulfillable demand? doesn't ought imply can. I think Lugstrup's response to this challenge is as follows. Ought doesn't imply can if the reason you cannot do it is your fault. For example, if a student can't complete an essay because they have drunk too much the night before and so are unable to do it, they still arguably ought to complete the essay and can be punished if they do not. Likewise, Lugstrup claims, in this case, we cannot deny it is our fault that we fail to love the neighbour on pain of giving up our sense of selfhood and agency, and hence responsibility for wrongdoing. For Lugstrup follows Luther in arguing that while we are not responsible for the good, we are responsible for the bad in turning against the good. Thus, in this case too, we can be held responsible for a demand that is unfulfillable, because it, it is our fault that it is the case that this is the case. Lugstrup thus takes himself to have established that we fall under an ethical demand that has these four key features of silence, radicality, one-sidedness and unfulfillability. <laughs>
Lukestrup also considers some more general meta-ethical problems that might be raised against his view. First of all, in arguing from our vulnerability to the ethical demand, isn't he arguing from is to ought? In response, Lukestrup essentially rejects the distinction. For example, if we take his key concept of vulnerability, it is hard to see how one could understand this concept without seeing how the fact of vulnerability also has some normative implications built into it. Secondly, Lukestrup sees he might be challenged by a scientific picture, for example, over free will or, or determinism. In response to this issue, Lukestrup argues that this challenge doesn't come from science itself, but from philosophical interpretations of science, which he thinks then can be questioned on philosophical grounds, given the extreme ethical revisionism that determinism involves. Thus, Lugstrip takes himself to have defended his conception of the ethical demand and shown how it can be supported given some metaphysical commitments. And arguably, he remains within the bounds of secular ethics, even given his conception of life as a gift, and so on. That is, his position here does not involve any commitment to God as the gift giver, and he is openly hostile to various aspects of Christian ethics as turning ethics um, into a kind of ideology which, is in, which imposes its theory of the good on others based on a claim to authority. Nonetheless, in the final main chapter of the book, he arguably makes a transition to religion. For he argues, given that we are all sinners, as we cannot make ourselves good through our own efforts, none of us can blame others for their wrongdoing and so we cannot forgive them in the authoritative sense. We can only forgive them as fellow sinners. That is, because I am a sinner like you, I have no authority over you from which I can then forgive you, as I am as bad as you are. Whereas authoritative forgiveness requires someone to be in a superior position, as when an employer decides to condone some mistake you have made, for example. Instead, the only kind of forgiveness I can offer you is that of a fellow sinner, which precisely means giving up this authority. But then, if we want authoritative forgiveness, we must bring God into the picture, as all fellow human beings are sinners and only God is not. Thus, at the end of the book, there is finally a turn to religion. However, that still leaves ethics itself secular, as ethic does not rest on God's command or authority or explain our ethical motivations in religious terms. All this remains thoroughly philosophical and unchallenged by this religious twist at the end. So now, if we go back over the outline of the ethical demand with which we started, the quote from Lugstrup, hopefully now it makes sense in the light of our discussion. Lugstrup says, First, I analyse how the life of one person is interwoven with the life of another, and from this I deduce the content of the ethical demand, which has to do with taking care of the life of the other person that has been surrendered to us. Some way into the book, I make it clear that the one-sidedness of the demand presupposes that life has been given to the, other per to the individual person. I have not thereby moved over to the particularly Christian sphere, however, but continue to clarify what can be stated in strictly human terms. So thus, in conclusion, to summarise what I think is interesting about Lugstrip's contribution, we can make the following points. First, he was a pioneer on central issues such as trust and vulnerability, and also in challenging the is-ought distinction and in questioning the principle that ought implies can. He has an interesting account of the sources of normativity, where I think he offers a secular natural law ethics at the level of the ethical demand as based on the normative force of our vulnerability to each other, which is not based on any command, authority or rights claim, either from God or from our fellow human beings. He offers a distinctive form of ethics, distinct from the big three of Kantianism, utilitarianism and virtue ethics, 
but with some relation to care ethics. He offers a distinctive Lutheran account of virtue, grace and life as a gift, but in a secularised form. His position bears some relation to ethical existentialism in his focus on the isolation of the ethical individual and hence the kind of radical responsibility and authenticity that ethical life requires. But on the other hand, his ethics is not hyperbolic and limitless. He also offers a defensible and plausible meta-ethics which resists various forms of scientism and reductionism. And finally, he is an interesting case when it comes to thinking about the relation between the religious and secular in the context of ethics. I therefore hope that this brief introduction may lead you to engage more closely with Lugstrup and his works. <laughs>